Um, before we get started, I wanted to mention uh, something about the Golan Heights that we were just at. Uh, for the, uh, when we get to Jerusalem and uh, on the Mount of Olives, I want to talk about the prophecy in Isaiah 17 concerning Damascus. And some of the things that I'm, I'm sure Danielle also shared, but uh, Ronnie had uh, told us about what's really going on in Syria right now. Very interesting. Uh, when Jesus said, nation will rise against nation, he was saying ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. And this is exactly what we're seeing right now happen in Syria. So we'll... Um, talk about that when we're in Jerusalem. But for this place, Caesarea Philippi, uh, join me in Matthew's Gospel chapter 16. While you're turning there, I just want to tell you that you can't even begin to imagine how much I've been looking forward to this particular site. We are at a very evil location. And this is actually what was known as the gates of Hades or the gates of hell. Now you cannot see it because of the trees, but this huge rock mountain and behind these trees you'll see this opening. It's the beginning of the Jordan River. But it was believed to be where the gates of hell were located. And it was in worship of the god Pan, P-A-N, Pan. And it's where we get our English word, panic. And this god Pan, this Pan god, was a god who was feared. They would actually offer child sacrifices to Pan with the hopes that when Pan would enter into the gates of hell and go down into the underworld that he would show them favor by providing them water for the fertility of their crops. And this was where the location was that they would worship the god Pan, a fearsome god and a powerful god right here at this place. Now the question is, why would Jesus bring his disciples to this place here at Caesarea Philippi? We're going to find out. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, verse 14, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? Verse 15, Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, verse 16, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And what he's saying there is you are Petros, little rock. And on this rock, different word, the word Petra, on this rock, which means great rock, you can almost imagine Jesus pointing to this great rock, on this rock I will build my church, and then listen to what he says, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Whoa. Wow. Levi, I want you to start over here. I'm going to, I took some screenshots on my iPad. I hope you can see it. Um, start, no pun intended, he's going to pan <laughs> around. <laughs> and I want you to look at it. What happened? It needs to cool down before you can use it. It's like Satan at work. Temperature. iPad needs to cool down before you can use it. Wow. Okay, well. 
<laughs> you know what? We're going to pray. <laughs> Lord, we have been really looking forward to this, and it's this particular location that I have sensed by the Holy Spirit that you have desired and do desire to do a profound work in our hearts as you speak into our lives. And so, Lord, would you just somehow enable it so that this visual can be seen on this iPad. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. It's still saying it. Okay. You know what? Go in the shade and let me know when it comes back on. Okay. I wonder what Peter felt like right about now. <laughs> Peter, right on. Exactly right. I can almost picture Peter kind of looking around at the other disciples. Did you hear what Jesus said? <laughs> Upon this rock. <laughs> That's what his name meant. Little rock. Peter. Pe Petros. Did you hear that, guys? <laughs> it's kind of like what he must have felt like when he was walking on water. In fact, someone humorously suggested that when Peter said in the boat, when they realized it was Jesus, bid me come, and he stepped out of the boat and started walking on water, and then he took his eyes off of Jesus. Some have suggested that he took his eyes off Jesus to look back at the disciples and go, hey, <laughs> check it out, right? Well, it's about to turn uh, in a whole different direction here for Peter in a moment, but um, why would Jesus say on this rock, the gates of hell will not prevail against you? Because it was this rock that the gates of hell heretofore had prevailed against them. And what he's saying is, I am the rock. And upon the rock of this confession, Peter, your profession that I am the son of the living God, the Christ, the Messiah, upon the rock of that confession. I want to show you this temple. This is an artist's rendition of the temple. And you can see, and we're going to be able to, Lord willing, walk up here and see the rock, the great rock behind us. This is an artist's rendition of the temple that they would worship, Pan. So Pan, <laughs> the temple of Pan. <laughs> Can you imagine what the disciples would be thinking as Jesus is saying to them that upon the rock, not that rock, on the rock of that profession, I will build my church. And he's about to give them the keys to the kingdom as well. And the gates of hell, th these gates, this rock will not prevail against them, against you. The next one I'm going to show is going to have a picture of what this God looked like. Hideous, really. Half goat, half man. Very sexual in nature. When we were on Mount Carmel, we were talking about how that Baal would come together with Asherah and they would have this intercourse, if you will, and then from that would come fertility and prosperity. And the Israelites were worshiping the god Baal. And the Israelites were worshiping this god Pan at this location. And this is why Jesus brings them here. The next one I want to show you, and you'll see it when we walk up there. There's going to be these little arches carved into this great rock. And in it were these images of this God Pan. Here's a, this is a good picture of it here. Okay, take this. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, that one. This is the God Pan that they would worship. This is what he looked like. And you'll see the 
kind of the carved arch inside the rock. And what Jesus is saying is it's upon this great rock, Petra, the rock of this confession, not that rock, that I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell, the gates of hell right here will not prevail against it. Uh, I'm going to continue on as he's showing you this uh, picture. In verse 19, he goes on to say, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. From that time on, we read verse 21, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Verse 22, very interesting. Peter took him aside. Can you just picture it? I love Peter. I re- wow. He, he takes the Lord aside. And, and, and we're told to rebuke him. To rebuke him. Are you kidding me? He's going to rebuke Jesus. And he says to him, Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in the mind the things of God, but the things of men. Just a few verses earlier. Right answer, Peter. Right on, Peter. The, you know, you, it's, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then a few verses later, get thee behind me, Satan. Wow. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, and this is key, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good, verse 26, will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man, verse 27, is going to come in His Father's glory and with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. What's the lesson of Caesarea Philippi? Here's the takeaway. First, the Lord wants to make Himself known. He wants to reveal Himself and reveal who the Christ is. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, he wants to build his church. This is the profession on Peter's rock-solid confession that he will build his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And thirdly, he wants to accomplish his will in our lives. It's God's will that Jesus go to the cross. This was why he came. This was so that the gates of hell could not prevail against us and against his church. And then fourthly and lastly, and I love this, he wants to ruin my plans. He wants to ruin me for him. And he does that by way of the cross, by dying to self and picking up the cross and following him the way up is the way down it's a paradox really the way up is the way down you want to live die you want to follow me pick up your cross deny yourself and follow me now as we walk up there uh you're going to be just blown away you're going to see down below i hope it's not uh too overgrown but There's a little flat area. That's where the actual temple was. But they would actually bring in these goats and they would mate and produce 
more goats as a symbol of the fertility of this half goat, half man god, this pan god that they were worshiping out of fear. And it was at this location. So uh, I, there's another picture I'm gonna, uh, uh, maybe I can show it to you later, but the temple was right at the opening and that is where they would worship this pan god. So I'm gonna uh, see, I don't know if you, if you wanna turn off the camera, if we can uh, uh, walk up there. I hope you don't mind, but I made the decision back at Caesarea Philippi to uh, wait until we got here because we had a limited amount of time and I really wanted for you to be able to hike up further and see where the Temple of Pan was and where the carve, you know, uh, places in the rock was so you could get that visual. Uh, but I wanted to, if you don't mind, sort of uh, dovetail off of that and then we'll tie into uh, the place that we're at here at Tel Dan. Uh, the devil is a defeated foe. Amen. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Uh, just this morning when I was preparing for today's teachings, I was reminded of an article that I was sent by somebody back home in our church. And I think it is perhaps the best illustration and explanation of how it is that state Satan still has the title deed as it were to this world we are in the world not of the world it's a fallen world and Satan still wreaks havoc in the world and will until the trumpet sounds and what I'd like to do is just share with you this story I put it on my iPad and it's titled, A Lesson from a Headless Snake. True story and very interesting. It's by Carolyn Ahrens, and she writes this. As a kid, I loved Mission Sundays when missionaries on furlough brought special reports in place of a sermon. Sometimes they wore exotic foreign clothing. They almost always showed a tray of slides documenting their adventures. If they were from a dangerous enough land, the youth in our congregation would emerge from our Sunday stupor <laughs> and listen intently. There is one visit I've never forgotten. The missionaries were a married couple, stationed in what appeared to be a particularly steamy jungle. I'm sure they gave a full report on churches planted or commitments made or translations begun. I don't remember much of that. What has always stayed with me is the story they shared about a snake. One day they told us an enormous snake, much longer than a man, slithered its way right through their front door and into the kitchen of their simple home. Terrified, they ran outside and searched frantically for a local who might know what to do. A machete-wielding neighbor came to the rescue, calming, marching, calmly marching into their house and decapitating the snake with one clean chop. You'll forgive the graphic nature of this, but the neighbor reemerged re triumphant and assured the missionaries that the reptile had been defeated. But... There was a catch, he warned. It was going to take a while for the snake to realize it was dead. A snake's neurology, true story, and blood flow are such that it can take considerable time for it to stop moving even after decapitation. For the next several hours, the missionaries were forced to wait outside while the snake thrashed about smashing furniture and flailing against the walls and windows, wreaking havoc until its body finally understood that it no longer had a head. 
sweating in the heat. They had felt frustrated and a little sickened, but also grateful that the snake's rampage wouldn't last forever. At some point in their waiting, they told us they had a mutual epiphany. I leaned in with the rest of the congregation, queasy, <laughs> but fascinated. Do you see it? Asked the husband. Satan is a lot like the big old snake. He's already been defeated. He just doesn't know it yet. In the meantime, he's going to do some damage. But never forget, he's a goner. The story captured our imaginations then because it was graphic and gory. <laughs> a stark contrast to the normal, genteel sermonizing we were used to receiving. But the story haunts me because I have come to believe it is an accurate picture of the universe. We are in the thrashing time, a season characterized by our pervasive cap capacity to do violence to each other and ourselves. The temptation is to despair. We have to remember, though, that it won't last forever. Jesus has already crushed the serpent's head. Amen. How's that? An apt description of the world that we live in as it waxes more and more evil seemingly by the day. This is another evil place. It's a place that represents, as Ronnie shared, the idolatry of the Israelites. I'm going to have you join me in 1 Kings chapter 12. I'll read uh, verses 25 through 30. You can follow along. We read there that Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam, verse 26, thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If, verse 27, these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan, right here. And verse 30, this thing became a sin. The people went even as far as Dan to worship the one there. This is the altar that he set up this worship of this image, reminiscent of when Aaron, when Moses tarried and wasn't coming back, after going up to the mount, he makes a golden calf. Where did he get that idea? Oh, Egypt, Egypt. <laughs> and he makes this golden calf and as hard as it is to imagine, Aaron says, this is the God who delivered you out of Egypt. And they worshiped, again, very graphic, very sexual in nat nature. They, where did they learn that from? Egypt, Egypt. Not only had God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, he still had to deliver the Egypt out of the Israelites. And that's a much more difficult do. And for him to say, this, this is the God, O Israel, that brought you up out of Egypt. You know what's really interesting to me? Throughout, replete throughout the Old Testament, you hear God say this, I am the Lord your God. Now, it would stand to reason that that would be a firm grasp of the obvious, right? Not so fast. I wonder where the emphasis was. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord. In other words, what God is saying is, 
that's not the God who delivered you out of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God, who delivered you out of Egypt. So here's this Jeroboam and interesting the detail we're given. He thinks to himself, hey, I can't have them going to Jerusalem to worship. I know what I'll do. I'll set up an altar here. Make it more, listen, convenient. Convenient. It's, it's closer. Too much of a hassle. You don't need to go all the way to Jerusalem and worship there. Hey, look, I've got a convenience 7-Eleven worship <laughs> here. <laughs> You'll forgive the silliness of the illustration, but a couple thoughts here by way of a personal application. Beware of the subtle danger of convenience. Have you ever heard someone say, well, you know, I worship God on the golf course. <laughs> no, seriously, I've actually had someone say that. Not in Hawaii. This was on the mainland. You know. <laughs> you know I, it, it's, well, that's convenient, isn't it? Here's what I'm thinking. When it comes to worship, when it comes to our worship of the Lord, our service for the Lord, that which is convenient has these built-in dangers. And what I mean by that is, it has the propensity for us to compromise to the degree in which our worship, under the banner of convenience, becomes idolatry. It becomes a false worship of a false god. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God is a jealous God, not jealous of us, jealous for us. Thou shalt have no other, thou shalt not make for yourself any graven images, nor should you ever bow down to them. And what Rehoboam did here was exactly that. And he did it because he didn't want them going to Jerusalem. Because were they to go to Jerusalem, and worship the Lord there instead of here, then he was done. And that's why he did it. And I think the lesson here, very simply, the takeaway here is, be very careful when worship becomes a convenience or we seek to make our worship of the Lord convenient to suit us. We make it convenient for us. I love the account of David when he's gonna purchase what would become the area known as the city of David. And it's offered to him, and he refuses to take it. And he says, I will not do anything for the Lord that doesn't cost me something. If it doesn't cost me, I won't do it. Boy, I tell you, there is a counting of the cost, isn't there? You know, the, like we were talking about at Caesarea Philippi, Denying, to, denying self, that's inconvenient, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I, I can't think of anything more inconvenient and unpopular, by the way. M many a church doesn't dare touch topics like death to self. Who wants to hear that? Denying oneself, dying to oneself, picking up one's cross. That... That doesn't fit the narrative of self. Self wants convenience. Self wants ease. You know, it's interesting. You don't have to really try hard to backslide. You ever notice that? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, it just comes so easy. <laughs> Too easy. Uh, I don't know about you, but after that lunch we just had, I had to repent. I just have to tell you. I, that. Oh my God, gluttony. I just, I thought, how can I get those grape leaves into the bus without anybody noticing? <laughs> the, the, the flesh rears its ugly head. The flesh says, I want, I want, I want. 
And the Spirit says, no, I die, I die, I die. You know what the problem with I is? It's right smack in the middle of the word sin. As I, right in the middle. <laughs> and here's the thing, it's also, as one has aptly noted, right smack in the middle of the word pride. I. Roy Hessian, and I'll end with this, in his classic work, The Calvary Road. A must read. Not for the faint at heart, by the way. I, I have a, I just read it for, I forget how many times. It's, I use it now really as a devotional. And uh, I read it again, and I just found myself putting it down, just gritting my teeth. I don't want to hear this. The chapter where he says the I needs to bow and become a C. I have to die in Christ. It's that broken, humble, bowed I that becomes a C. And I chafe at even the mention of it. I'm, think, I'm thinking about this trip. Uh, and by the way, uh, you guys are magnificent. I, and I, I mean that. You are a great group. You guys, all joking aside, you, you're not complainers. <laughs> at least not in front of me. Except for right now, here. <laughs> You guys are just grateful, and it, you guys have been a great group. And I really appreciate that. You have no idea. But here's the thing. When you're sleep deprived, and you're hungry, and you're thirsty, and you're tired, and you're hot, <laughs> does not self demand that you do something about it? Are you kidding me? Oh my goodness, I checked into the hotel room, and the air conditioning wasn't on. And it was hot and uncomfortable for me. That's not very convenient for me. And we become angry and... That's... Self. I, I, by the way, I'm not pointing at anybody. I have to be careful when, when I use, you know, illustrations like that and I'm looking at somebody and I go, oh, He knows! <laughs> I don't. I, I really don't. Nobody told me anything. I, I know nothing. I know nothing. I'm speaking of myself. I know me. <laughs> Anyway, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for just the practical, applicable truths that we can take from these sites, from your word, which gives us the backstory behind these sites, that we can take them with us from this place and by the Holy Spirit begin the process of having you build it into our lives so it becomes real for us as you apply it to our lives. Lord, will you do that? We're asking you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.